Good afternoon, everybody. This is Sangeeta Saxena, editor, Aviation and Defense Universe, getting you live from Indy Airport, which is an event happening at Greater Noida. And here we have with us somebody who has a very important task for the nation with him, skilling the people in the aviation and aerospace world. We have with us Wing Commander Rachid Bhatnagar, who is the CEO of the Aerospace and Aviation Skills Council, which is a part of the NSDC. Welcome to our chat room, Rachid. Wonderful to have you here. Thank you, Singhita, for having me here. Uh, so, Rachit, yes, absolutely. It's such a pleasure to have you. And the first thing I'd like to understand from you is, what is the council all about? Okay, so let me put it this way. Uh, this is uh, one of the 37 uh, sector skill councils which was formed under the Skill India umbrella by Ministry of Skill Development and Entrepreneurship and uh, comes, you know, uh, as a formation you know, from the, uh, the National Skill Development Corporation. So, uh, they have uh, you know, got a you know, skill gap study done by KPMG Advisory Services Limited in around 2015. And uh, so they have done a complete uh, pan India uh, geographical survey you know, and demographic survey where all the emerging airports are coming up, airline, which are the emerging airlines coming up in which all areas. So uh, even considering the Uran scheme, which was you know, also being launched at that time, Ode Deshka Am Nagarik. So considering all these uh, demographic aspects, and uh, so they found out some kind of skill gap study uh, and which are the having you know which is the uh, areas having more demands and this skill uh, council was formed to have the maximum impact on the uh, uh, skilling domain of the general entry level requirements so they fo they formed you know a kind of five sub sectors in this council starting with the uh, airline operations then airport operations and ground handling and then uh, came the uh, aerospace uh, manufacturing repair and overall MRO what we call in the, in the abbreviated uh, form and then comes aerospace design development and aerospace manufacturing and assembly. So we have uh, right from airline airport to aerospace which works in the background. Uh, these are the five subsectors which were formed and to the latest addition what we are having is the uh, urban air mobility or also we are, uh, in a uh, primary form we are calling it unmanned aerial systems, drones. So these are the subsectors uh, by which it was formed and uh, so we have around 73 job roles. Uh, we have made the curriculum as per the industry standards. So here we are right now. And uh, also which I want to understand from you is that uh, whom do we train? Do we get people from the industry who are unskilled and need to be trained or do we have people who are absolutely trained but uh, need this mid-level certification because probably they don't have it. All right. So we, we uh, have the complete uh, domain skillings, you know, across the horizontal and verticals, which means we do the upskilling of the, you know, the existing uh, trained technicians uh, or existing, you know, manpower, you know, who or workforce who's already into, you know, have done uh, 10 to 15 years of service and uh, need upskilling. We need, we do reskilling of them, you know, because there are certain domains Aerospace aviation is a domain which you know changes very very fast because of technology technological aspects. So they need a reskilling to the you know the the modernized and the, and the technologically advanced uh, sectors and topics. And then we also do uh, kind of uh, recognition of prior learning also. So this is again one of the factors where you know uh, we, like it has been found that a lot of you know the people who have gained experience maybe you know kind of aerospace manufacturing they have been doing cnc manufacturing turning and milling and uh, they're working in the aviation aerospace domain but they don't have the aerospace skilling certificate so this we also do the uh, rpl uh, recognition of prior learning and so this is all besides uh, the basic fresh skilling which is required to be done for uh, right from the iti diploma or even 10th or 12th passed, uh, passed out students. Right. And uh, when this happens, uh, does that mean that you also, uh, suppose they are already in a job and have come in between for a midterm training, fine. But for people who are not in jobs and have come for this sort of a skill training, does it also mean uh, that it's an exercise of placement for you? Yes, definitely. Uh, the basic idea of uh, skilling uh, by mm -hmm. any sort, uh, you know, uh, set, service, uh, you know, uh, skill sector council is ultimately the placement based. 
so uh, we have various programs you know coming uh, from the government uh, which is uh, comes under the umbrella of uh, pradhan mantri kaushal vikas yojana pmkvy by ministry of skill development and entrepreneurship and also we have from other ministry programs ddu gky we have nulm national urban livelihood missions and uh, from ministry of minority affairs so these are the various uh, other ministry programs also which comes in and we act as a pia which means project implementation agency the basic guideline or basic you know nemesis on which the whole skilling concept is based is that uh, uh, the various you know like we work with a network of training partners all across india so any program which is which comes from the government is completely sponsored so uh, the trainee don't have to pay anything although uh, there is a different version now coming in and the uh, next PMKVY 4.0 version uh, in which the ministry is of the view that a candidate has to has to have a shell out some amount so that they have some skill in the game in the whole ecosystem. But till now the, it was completely sponsored training but uh, in uh, right from the mobilization to the skilling but at the end of the skilling the last trench of you know the uh, sponsored money was released to a training partner only when uh, they have placed a candidate to at least a 70% uh, the, in a batch. So that is the kind of uh, regulation which uh, uh, government has that the skill which has been done is completely having a very positive you know, outcome. Yeah. Okay and uh, which means that you know if I am interested I have my basic qualification and I am 10th pass that is what you want to say. And I want to learn about, uh, you know, what I can do in the aerospace industry, I can come to you. So that is something which is very nice. Now, does that also mean that you have your ITIs, which are uh, part of your partners when it comes to certification and giving the trainings? Do, do you have engineering colleges who contribute to it? Who are the people who generally contribute to it? Okay, so uh, I would say in the airline segment uh, where we have a very entry level you know qualifications like 10th and 12th pass but at a, a design development uh, uh, segment we have a diploma and engineers and in the aerospace manufacturing we have iti and diploma both so these people when they get trained already they have a certificate called ntc uh, when they do uh, iti or diploma it's called national trade certificate but then there is no specifically aerospace manufacturing or aerospace certificate what they have. So then they do a kind of upskilling program with the sector skill council. So one of the program is picked up our job role what we call in, in the parlance of sector skill council uh, that is picked up like for example aerospace design development or aerospace design assistant mechanical or aerospace design you know or maybe a technician or electronics aerospace electronics technician so that job role is picked up and they do a three to four months of training with one of the training partner and do a hands-on so the skilling component is very, very importantly let me tell you that uh, it's not a typical you know education degree it has to be a 60 percent hands-on skilling or ojt with the industry so when this program is done and then only we a skilling certificate is awarded so we act as a awarding body in that case, get the assessment done and certification done. So this is how they pick up the aerospace qualification over and above the their general degree of diploma in IT. How do you pick up your assessors? Okay, so uh, uh, like uh, we I, I told you initially that we have a kind of a, a system of 100 or 110 training partners. So they they act as a third party training uh, th uh, training uh, partners. So they are accredited and affiliated to us similarly we have a system of assessors uh, which are well established assessment agencies and uh, to a you know a system of bidding and you know for the lot of audits we select them you know as our third party assessor bodies because uh, the statistical councils don't have that capacity to move around physically and you know keep doing assessment in the far flung areas of uh, pan india so this is how we select the training partner and but now let me add you here uh, this system is getting further robust and uh, now we have a, another regulatory body which you must have all heard of very recently uh, NCVET so National Council of Vocational Education and Training this NCVT body has come out and uh, now is doing a regular acting as a regulatory body for any 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 awarding bodies 
so the sector scale councils have to be you know uh, be you know have to apply to the ncvt to become an awarding body or we can have a uh, like a dual uh, uh, kind of awarding role maybe we do uh, both assessment certification or we do only assessment and uh, or only certification so this is how uh, we are doing it so now a uh, central repository of all assessment agencies will be available at ncvt and at the end of any training program the batches which they pass out we will be applying to ncvt and they will be giving us assessments okay yeah. and that's a, a very systematic system i think right yeah. and uh, how many students at one point in time do you normally have at the council who are getting skilled okay so uh, uh, it depends on the programs so uh, if we have you know government programs rolled out so we have uh, from the and plus other ministry programs also coming in so if we have uh, maybe anywhere and any kind of batch you know minimum batch size mm -hmm. is 20 that's what we try to have and so it can have a multiple batches of fee based of the government sponsored mm -hmm. so it can be you know uh, at any given time be thousand batches or maybe i would say thousand students thousand students i know are getting trained through various training partners mm -hmm. so in a sector skill council to have assessment we can have you know uh, maybe a thousand students uh, at any given time and these students get trained by various training partners in various locations or the locations are yours in bangalore only no no, no. so the statistical council uh, for aerospace aviation is based out of bangalore but it's a national body it's a national awarding body i would say and we have a uh, training partners all across india right from the northeast tripura nagaland assam to uh, uh, JNK, Himachal Pradesh, to Rajasthan, Gujarat, and everywhere. So uh, the, there are airline cabin crew training partners. Uh, they they are you know airline customer service executive training partners, or they in a one uh, uh, I would say training training center, and they have two or three job roles parallelly you know going on. So mm -hmm. any kind of system is, is there. But primarily I would say the aerospace uh, training centers or training partners are more or less. Uh, government based uh, like HAL uh, you know they have training centers because these are mm. the very high end or highly capital intensive uh, mm. training environment you need to have very niche you know the training machinery uh, like a, you know four or five axis CNC machines and you know uh, the other design development uh, ecosystem so this is this cannot be have you know have had by you know any of the uh, normal training partners so these are mostly owned by the HAL or NAL or uh, you know the Pratt & Whitney or you know the private other players like you know Collins Aerospace so they have the system or you know like we have a Boeing engineering centers we have Airbus engineering centers so we are trying to even collaborate with them to you know do the co-certification or co-assessments for the trainees. Right and uh, tell me one thing the trainers you said are there is there a program you have for training the trainers? Of course so we have a system of TOT we call them uh, training of trainers and training of master trainers. Similarly, we have training of assessors and training of master assessors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so this is a system where we have to have, uh, you know, the very, very qualified trainers who have done at least 100 uh, trainings in a controlled atmosphere to be even, you know, called as master trainers. Mm -hmm. So, uh, those systems we have and we keep repeatedly doing, you know, the uh, training of the fresh uh, trainers or, you know, the existing trainers, refresher courses. Uh, this is an ongoing system because you know we have a lot of you know advanced uh, technologies coming in that is one thing but also we have one latest thing addition is called employability skills so there's a es in the short form we're calling it uh, employability skills which has been added uh, as a requirement by the regulatory body uh, ncvt and for any of the job role training which is done be it aerospace aviation drones the participant should also go through employability skills which generally you know, consists of kind of you know, learning a, a soft skills, English, you know, and entrepreneurship skills, or maybe you know, talking into a particular language and how to connect it to himself or herself, and uh, maybe having what kind of you know the hygienic factors, uh, team building. Uh, so all these aspects are you know, clubbed together in a one module called ES. Yeah. So that kind of uh, training also goes on for everybody. 
that was wonderful actually it's such a lovely conversation and uh, you know i really don't want to stop i think we've done a lot of understanding and uh, you know as in when the process increases and moves i'm sure you'll have much more to tell us and i think it was a real uh, experience and an increase of our knowledge bank because we always felt that it uh, aerospace is a high profile world highly technical world and uh, everybody who's there is highly technical so it doesn't require training they're all coming trained from you know aerospace departments and iits and yeah. this and that and then you suddenly realize that no there are people beneath who also are not highly educated but they can get trained and skilled to the best practices and best levels the industry has globally thank you so much rachit for speaking with us it was wonderful to have you and really hope that this continues it's a great task you are doing to a great industry and let's hope you know it continues and you keep evolving and you know planning new programs and new things so that the aerospace in india is at par with the world and also at times i'm just hoping goes beyond the best in the capacity thank you sir thank much. you thank you sir for having me on the sidelines of indie or airport or india airport i would say thank you so much <laughs>